You're listening to Art Affairs, episode 59. Today I'll be talking to Andy Kehoe. So my name is Michael Faith, and this is Art Affairs. Art Affairs is my attempt at shining a spotlight on the many wonderful people that make up this amazing art community, featuring conversations with artists, gallerists, curators, telling their stories. You can dig through previous episodes, complete with show notes, at artaffairspodcast.com. But the best way to stay plugged in is to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And if you're really enjoying the show and want to help support what I'm doing here in an even bigger way, check out the Art Affairs Patreon. Not only does it give you an opportunity to help keep the show going, but there are several community-oriented benefits as well, like getting early access to episodes and suggesting questions for upcoming guests. You can find all the information about that at patreon.com slash artaffairs. You can also connect with the show on Instagram and Facebook at Art Affairs Podcast. All right, so today's guest is artist Andy Kehoe. Andy's lived most of his life in Pittsburgh. But as you'll see in our conversation, when it came time to go to school, he actually went to Parsons in New York with a focus on illustration. But obviously, he didn't stay there. He very quickly moved on to his own personal art practice and never looked back. We talk about how he first got started in his art career in the mid-2000s, the super unique way his art has evolved over the years, what he's been up to lately, and a whole lot more. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Andy Kehoe. Andy, welcome to the show, man. It's good to have you on. Thanks, man. I'm glad we can make this happen. During this uh, crazy pandemic era, it's really hard to get anything going like you plan it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, know, I don't know how long we say that. Like, it's been two years now, and I I still feel like I'm compelled to say the pandemic times. It's like, I guess it's it's BCAC sort of thing. It's like, we're now COVID. <laughs> yeah. yeah, try living with the... I meant, like, my wife's a healthcare worker, and she, like, mm. you know, works with a epidemiologists and she's very into stats so i know everything that's going on and uh, it's it's almost like living in a different world like everyone's like walking around carefree like oh it's over we're free and the numbers are like oh no <laughs> so uh it, it is weird like especially for her because uh healthcare workers live in this world where everyone's just kind of like you know everything's normal and then she's in living in this utter differently real reality, and you know, it's really hard for her actually. Yeah, because uh, all her friends are just out doing their normal things, and she's just seeing what she sees. And it's you know, healthcare workers on on a whole, I think, are going through this like reality crisis with this. It's pretty tough. Yeah, it was was she a, a healthcare worker during the worst parts of it? Like in the oh yeah yeah for sure. And that's tough. Like um, she was uh. She worked in the ICU for 10 years, and then um, she got her doctorate in uh, nurse practitioning. So um, she has a different office job now. She works with uh, palliative patients, but she uh, she still saw the worst of it, for sure. And she wasn't like, you know, in the in the trenches with the ICU grunts, but uh, she she saw it, for sure. Yeah, and I have a friend that works in, in the Minneapolis area that... that- did see the worst of it on the on the ICU front, so it's like yeah. tense outside and like just awful. Um, so what a great way to start off the show. Yeah. Ooh, <laughs> really lighten things up there. Yeah. So let's dive into your background a little bit, and and I, cause I usually like to start there. And, and I know that you were born and raised in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Uh, what was the area like where you grew up? Uh, I mean, it was a progression of places. Um, my mom moved here from Korea. Uh, she met my father. Um, in Korea, it's kind of this very typical, like, um, mixed Asian story is my father was in the military over there for service, met my mother and came over here and we were born. So, um, I am like half Korean. Uh, the other half is like, I call it half Pittsburgh cause it's just <laughs> Irish, German. I mean, uh, it's pretty much just Pittsburgh as you can get around here. Um, so when we first moved here. I lived in this place called Sheridan. It was pr- 
kind of close to the city. Um, uh, very, I don't know. Back then it was like a, it was a cool place to live and it's kind of different now. But then when my mother remarried, we moved more to the suburbs in a place called Moon Township. And, uh, yeah, it was all right. It was like pretty typical, uh, I think place to grow up. Eventually got into skateboarding and that kind of changed my life a bit. Was your, was your father still in the service or did, did he retire at that point? Oh, he was only in the army for that little bit. Mm. And then, um, my mom divorced, they got divorced like when we were pretty young. So we never really grew up with him. Um, we, we mostly grew up with my stepfather, which we call our father, you know, cause he yeah. adopted us. And what kind of work did your, your mom do? Um, she mostly just raised us. I mean, she, uh, we were twins. Yeah. <laughs> so she was like in a new country, um, basically on her own after like a year, um, working a job, raising twins, you know, she just, she had a lot to deal with. Sure. Uh, but when she first, when, um, we were young, she was uh, working as a hostess, this Italian restaurant in uh, downtown Pittsburgh. Uh, it was pretty legendary back then, this restaurant. And uh, she just walked in. She's like, I need a job. I'll learn everything. <laughs> and she like memorized the whole menu. She's, uh, you know, she's uh, very resilient. And uh, yeah, back then it was like the bar that all the Steelers and all the like mm. old like Pittsburgh legends went to. So, you know, like Franco Harris dropped her off at our house one day. Wow. <laughs> just like these like Steelers guys are all around our life. And uh, it was cool. No, that's awesome. And, and and you mentioned your brother, Ben, um, who's also an artist. So, I mean, you mm-hmm. guys must have had a pretty creative household growing up is what I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm guessing we're pretty easy. I, I say this, but I'll go back to this. But like, uh, you just put some crayons and some paper in front of us and we we're like entertained for hours. So it was something that was always in us. For whatever reason, we just always like drawing. And then it was also during the golden heyday of like Saturday morning cartoons. So like, yeah, we're all just always surrounded by like artwork. Do you, I mean, I guess thinking back and I I know that, um, you know, being so young, you may not have memories that far back, but do you, do you have a feel for what sparked that creativity? If, if neither of, you know, your parents were artists, you, you didn't necessarily have that around you from a profession perspective, but what do you think sparked your creativity? I don't know. I, I honestly just think we always had big imaginations. Mm. Like, uh, we always just lived in a kind of different world. Um, I think having a twin brother really helped because we just like, I don't know, we had each other always. And we just like kind of fed off each other. And yeah, we just created these worlds and we just lived in them. I know you're big into comics too. Like what, what kind of, uh, and even drew your own comics at one point is, is what I read. <laughs> like what, what yeah. kind of comics were you into back then? Um, we were all into like the, the, all the Marvel DC stuff. And then, uh, I got super into like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comics and the, the comic that really changed my life was, uh, Akira. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the comic is, I read the comic before the movie mm-hmm. and the comic, it was just, I mean, it, it changed my life kind of. Like, I didn't know that level of craftsmanship was, like, achievable until I saw, like, uh, his work, Katsuhiro, uh, Katsuhiro Atoma. And uh, just the level of detail. And I was like, this is what I want to strive to be, to have this level of detail. But as for comics, <laughs> we were, uh, we made this comic about these rodents that were cops. And there were these, like, cop rodents Oh, wait. And then they turned into mafia rodents somehow. <laughs> they got and corrupted. Then, uh, yeah, there was just a lot of people getting whacked. Because uh, <laughs> we were writing with our friend who was Italian. He was like this Italian kid. So it quickly turned into a, a mafia narrative. And uh, Nice. But looking back at those comics, they were like, they were pretty violent. Uh, like today, I think we would have definitely gotten counseling if someone saw those drawings. But... You know, they were just fantasy. I mean, I could definitely see the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle like inspiration because you know, if you're drawing rats that are doing police work and eventually becoming <laughs> mob bosses. <laughs> Did you ever see the movie Tango and Cash? Yeah, yeah. And as a kid, I haven't seen it as an adult, but yeah, it was funny. Like we wrote this comic, like when they were cops, you know, they went to jail, 
and they had to fight people in jail and escape. And then Tango and Cash came out, and I was like, it's pretty much the same plot. <laughs> <laughs> That's the level of writing that movie is. It was basically written by, like, eight-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I read that you're also really into fairy tales, too, and I think even had one of those, like, kid tape players with fairy tales on them that you'd walk around just listening to. Um, I mean, just tell me about that. Like, what do you think that that experience uh, with comics and fairy tales and this more narrative driven um, art uh, focus, do you think that left a mark on you and it kind of fostered some of your own creative expression back then? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, like the first uh, audio device we ever had was uh, like this Fisher Price tape player and it came with a bunch of audio books and then our mom ended up getting us more like she got us this whole Hans Christian Erickson uh, collection and we should just yeah, just sit around and like lose ourselves in these worlds and uh, that that really stuck with us we also used that tape recorder to record ourselves doing a bunch of crazy stuff <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that? Do you remember that Home Alone tape recorder that they sold after that movie got really big? It, it was like the one that Kevin used to record different sound effects that he'd played. Yeah, the- yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ours was weird, very rudimentary compared to that. Yeah, but yeah, we had such a good time with that tape player. Um, but yeah, like definitely like those those fairy tales and just getting lost in those worlds. Like it was magical for sure. Is it something that your your parents actively like encouraged in you? Like, were they supportive of your interest in 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 the arts? Yeah, my mom definitely was. Um, I think part of it was just like it would keep us busy, you know, out of her hair. Um, but she's always been very supportive of uh, my artwork. Um, my dad, it took him a while. Mm. When your when your kid says you want to go to art, they want to go to art school, and you're looking at the finances and the return on investment, all those things. He's like, oh. <laughs> but like when I graduated in the Parsons, it was Parsons was my third school, and uh, he saw my work in the New York Times as an illustration. He was like, "Oh, cool! I'm proud of you." Nice. You know, you just needed to see that the accomplishment. But, yeah, but my mom was like always like very supportive. And you mentioned your third school, and I wanted to ask you about that because you've written about doing sort of a tour of art schools for a while before landing at Parsons. So I guess what what was it about those other schools that I guess didn't impress you or you didn't feel was a good fit? Um, well, I started out at a uh, university of the arts in Philly. Um, I just, I didn't know what I wanted to do really back then. So I initially wanted to do animation. So I was going to do, I was going to learn hand animation. So I went through the foundation, all that stuff. It was great. I was like, yeah, I'm in my zone. Like, um, I, I'm where I belong. And then I started doing hand animation and I was like, shoot me. <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> I hate this so much. Like it is torture to draw the same thing over and over for me. And, and I sucked at it. Like I would like draw someone walking and their head would just get big and small and big <laughs> and small. And I'm like, ah, this is impossible. I don't know how people do this. And, uh, so I quickly got out of that and I was like, illustration, that's for me. Cause I could spend like, you know, a day or two in a single drawing. And I was like, yeah, that's what I want. And then I started doing that, but university arts, they don't really teach you anything like, um, technique or media wise. They're just like, here's an assignment, figure it out. And I was like, I don't know how to paint. I don't know. How to... All I know how to do is draw. And so it was just very frustrating. Like, uh, I just didn't know what, what medium I wanted. And, uh, so I was like, and this was, uh, 96, 97. And this is when the multi multimedia boom started happening. And, um, University of the Arts had a new multimedia department. So I was like, yeah, that sounds great. I want to do that. And so I joined that, that department. And, you know, we're learning Photoshop. Like, this was like Photoshop 2. You mm. couldn't even, like, undo more than once. <laughs> it was crazy. So, but, le- I mean, that was the one good thing is learning Photoshop. Like, that was an invaluable thing to learn in my lifetime. But they're like, yeah, let's do, let's learn HTML and, like, or uh, all this coding. And I was like, I am so, this is out of my element, too. And I was just so depressed by that point. Also at that point, like we were raised very strictly under my mother. 
And at this point, I'm like, I'm letting free. I'm going to party every night. I just like, <laughs> I went crazy. All those years of like not being able to do stuff, I was like, oh, I'm letting it all out now. And I just reached a point where I was like, I wasn't really going to class and just didn't know what I wanted to do. And I called my mom up and I'm like, I'm lost. <laughs> mm. uh, I need to leave. And so she's like, all right, come home. We'll figure it out. And that's, yeah, that's why I left. When I got home, my mom was, my parents are horrified that I was just going to like, you know, fuck off and like do nothing with my life. Sure. I didn't blame them because even back then when I went home, I was just like going out and partying and getting it all up. So I ended up uh, applying to this school called Ringling School of Art and Design. The name changed now. I don't know what it is now. But they're really well known for 3D animation. Mm. So I was like, yeah, I'll try out 3D animation. And uh, all the Pixar stuff and all this stuff started coming out. So, And I got accepted. And maybe a couple months before I was going there, they're like, oh, we made a mistake. Our 3D department's full. Oh. I was like, I was like, all right, let's do illustration then. I guess it's just what I'm meant to do. So... It was funny because, like, when I applied there, I went there in person, showed them my portfolio, and I got accepted. And then I went there, and they're like, oh, wait, we just saw that you flunked out of your last semester at University of the Arts. Because I, yeah, I just left. I didn't go back. And I was like, uh, they're like, well, you're here now. May as well. It's like, whew. <laughs> and my portfolio was good enough. So, um, but I went there, and it was actually pretty great. They, uh, they taught me. We had one class, this media class, where they taught me like how to do acrylic, watercolor, like oil rub, like all these different techniques. And this is like exactly what I wanted. And um, they're actually he's actually the person that taught me how to acrylic paint because uh, before then I was just drawing everything, importing it into Photoshop, or inking it, then importing it in, and then just coloring everything in Photoshop. It was like really crude, and but I didn't know what else to do. So he was the first person that taught me how to paint. I took a oil painting class, learned how to oil paint. Like, uh, it really set me up. But um, they didn't have any financial aid. My dad was able to like get a loan for me at the first year, but this, the, the later years it couldn't happen. So I was like, I went to the financial aid department. I was like, listen, I can't afford it unless you can like help me out. I gotta leave. And they're like, we can't help you. Mm. So uh, I just had to leave. Um, so I went up. My brother was living in Philly. So I went up there, lived with him, and applied to like three schools in New York. And worked at Bennigan's for a year. Saved up money. <laughs> Philly's a trip, man. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever lived there? I have not, no, but I've had a few folks on who, um, you know, still live there today and they seem to have a really active art community. I'm, I'm not sure what it was like back when you were living there, but. Yeah, late 90s was pretty wild there, like, <laughs> especially just living right in the city. Like I've lived, you know, a decent amount of places, but the most like stories I have were from Philly. People are just, <laughs> <laughs> they are crazy there. It's so funny. People used to cross the street just to insult me. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. They'd be like, one time I was carrying this painting and it was, I was bringing it to my friend. I was coming off the train too. I had all this luggage with me and I was just trekking it to my friend's house. And he's like, four dudes came over and they're like, oh man, did you make that painting? It's like, yeah, yeah. I made it a couple of years ago. You know, I'm giving it to my friend. They're like, oh yeah, yeah. Then like, that shit's corny. And they all started <laughs> laughing at me and they're like, oh, ha, 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 just pointing at me. And I was like, oh, fucking Philly, man. <laughs> did they just walk over just to bully you? That's. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guess, how did you, so, you know, you, you left the, the second school because of financial reasons, less to do with, you know, your interest in what they were teaching, but what ultimately led you to Parsons? Was that just one of the four schools that accepted you, or was there something particular about it that you liked? Yeah, actually, uh, I applied to Pratt, Parsons, and, um, God, what's the other one? School, oh, S God. SVA? Yeah, SVA, School of Visual Arts. And School of Visual Arts, I think, was my number one. And But Parsons just uh, gave me the better deal, honestly. Uh, I think I, I got accepted to all three, but Parsons like gave me the the most support. So I um, 
went there and I'm glad I did. Like I had such a good experience there. Like the, the people I was in school with and my teachers just really set me up. But like the first week I was there, like, I, I don't know if you know this, um, my dorms were downtown, downtown Manhattan. My, from my window, like I had a perfect view of the world trade center. Oh, wow. And so I moved to New York, August, 2001. Wow. So okay. when I got there, I was like excited to be in New York, obviously. Like I was only, I only went to New York a couple of times to like go to some like crazy raves. So I don't really have like a clear picture of what New York was. And, um, so I was getting to know my way around, getting to know the subway. And then maybe a couple of weeks later, I look up to this horrible boom and it woke me up and I was like, you know, like I've lived in the city up to this point for a while, different cities, and I'm used to loud noises, but I was like, this is different. And then I get out of my bed and I see a bunch of people running towards my building. I was like, what the hell is going on? And then I look up and I see like the trade centers on fire, like the very top of it. So I was like, oh my God. So I had met this dude, uh, John Vitale, like uh, a few days earlier, and we became like kind of buds, mostly because we like the same directors uh, movies. And went up there and I was like, holy shit, you seeing this? And they're like looking down, they're like, what's going on? It's like, guys, look up. And they're like, oh my God. And um, he's a photographer. So we felt the need to go out and document it, you know? Sure. So we walked as close as we could to the Trade Center. Um, just like through all this mass of people and it's just like this constant rain of documents. It's, it was just surreal and I lost him and through the crowd and I was like, you know, I found some like high ground on this lamppost. I was looking for him and then like people were screaming. I was looking up and I saw people jumping Wow! and I was like, oh, this is awful. And I was like, I, what am I doing out here? I, I need to go back. And then as soon as I turned around, I heard this like, and I look up and the building's collapsing. Wow. And you're right under it? Yeah. Jesus as close Christ. as you could get to it. Looking up at it, falling down. And it was like, yeah, it was like a movie. Like every floor is just exploding under the other one. And I was just like, everyone was in shock. And like, someone's like, you know, Ron, get out of here. And then everyone just kind of snapped out of it. And it was just weird because I turned around, started running, and there was people that just like paralyzed. They just like fell over in fear and shock. And it was, I've never seen that, you know? And then I, and I hear it collapsing behind me and I'm like trying to look for somewhere to like hide. And there's like these huge pots. This was like in, this is close to Wall Street. And I look and there's already 10 people behind everything. And I was like, all right. I just kind of resigned myself. And I was like, I'm going to die. This building's gonna, like, if it's falling forwards towards me, like I'm going to die. And then uh, the cloud came and just knocked me on my face. And it was shocking. It was like shell shock. Like the, the impact of that. And I was like... I kind of came to, couldn't see anything because of all the dust. And then I was breathing in all the ash mm -hmm. and just like gagging. And uh, then I put my shirt over my mouth and I was like be able to breathe. And then it was like that uh, total silence, just everything kind of settling after that. And then I just hear people and I was able to like see a little bit at that point, like just like shades of white and yellow kind of. And I saw someone... I grabbed someone's shoulder and we just started like walking forward and heard some glass breaking. So I'd, like I went over towards it and I helped these people kick in this window, this bank, just so we can get out of the dust. And yeah. And then we're like in this bank behind like the teller stations and everything. It was like really weird. And everyone's just like white covered in dust. And all you could see was like, everyone's like red eyes and like tears coming down. And, uh, we just like checked up on each other and I was like, just desperate to get back home, you know? Cause like, I was like, if this one fell down, the next one could fall down. And, uh, 
but everything was like, I went out, everything's just covered in white. So I had no idea where I was. Like, I didn't know where I was to begin with. And then I eventually found my way back and like Parsons, our dorms had like locked the doors. So they like pointed at me and like, I went in and like, everyone was looking at me like, oh my God. And yeah, I was just covered. And they're like, all right, go upstairs. Cause they, they had everyone downstairs. Cause like, uh, they evacuated everyone from the dorms, just had them downstairs. And they're like, yeah, go up, take a shower. And I'd like drywall, like stuck in my hair. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I remember images of that with people just walking around with ash, just covering them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I was like one of those people. Wow. I, I had no idea. I didn't know that. So, I mean, have you had, I've heard stories about just people that were that close having like breathing problems later in life, stuff like that. Have you had any issues like that? I was really worried about that. Mm. Cause I definitely like took in lungs, lungfuls of that ash. And, uh, I, I've gotten checked up a few times over the years, and it looks like I'm I'm okay. Okay. Like, I have some asthma, but I think it's from living with cats that I'm allergic to. <laughs> right. Worth it. But yeah, I definitely lucked out in that department. But it was, it was so surreal, like, watching it on the news, and then looking out at the window, and, like, seeing what was going on at the news. And, like, I don't know. I mean, it was traumatizing, obviously. But being like witness to that kind of huge global event, like it was just, I don't know, something that like not many people got to experience, you know? And as awful as it was, like, you know, it's like an indelible part of like my life and like made me who I am in the end. Yeah. No, that's crazy. I mean, the fact that you'd only been in New York for a month at that point, and <laughs> yeah, I was like, welcome to New York. Weeks. Yeah. <laughs> New York was like interesting after that because everyone was like, I don't know, helping each other out. Like everyone was like really chill for like a couple of weeks and then it kind of went back to normal. But there was like also this like new level of paranoia. Like there was like anthrax scares and like all this stuff going on and everyone was on edge. Yeah, I saw someone jump in front of a subway train. Like it was like, wow. it was a, it was a crazy part of my life for sure. And so I guess, you know, after graduating, once you got through with your degree, you got your, your BFA in 2003, um, did you stick around New York after that or did you go back to Pittsburgh? I did stick around New York, um, maybe for a year. Um, a half of that was to experience a non-school New York experience. Because when I was in school, I was just, it was just all school. I didn't like do anything else in New York really, but work work in school and work at the restaurant. So when I had no school, I, I did uh, have a crazy few months in New York, just like living it up. I meant like living it up like a poor kid, like <laughs> <laughs> getting free beers, uh, bringing like whiskey bottles into bars and dancing a lot. And I guess, you know, as far as uh, professional work goes, I know that you did a little bit of commercial illustration work after school. Like what kind of jobs was, was that? And what, what, what kind of uh, you know, roles were you doing? Yeah, illustration back then was like, we were like right on the edge of the, um, the internet era, kind of. Cause back then we had to like go to, go to like Barnes and Noble, look up the magazines we wanted to be in, look up the editors, find the address, make a postcard, send it to that, uh, art director, and then hope they call you. And it was so, yeah, such a convoluted process. Like Village Voice, you had to go like drop off your whole portfolio. They would look at it, maybe call you. So I'd gone into uh, New York Times and um, worked with, I think it was Garnaccia. He was the art director back then. And he was fantastic. And he's like, yeah, we'll get you some like spot illustrations. I did like the a book review then some like uh, op-ed stuff. And it was like my first like professional like illustration work. And then did some random magazine work. But also during this time, my illustration concept teacher, this guy named Jordan Issop, started introducing me to the art scene of New York. And uh, this was a pretty magical time for this, t- this art scene. It was like a, uh, just coming out, it was like Barry McGee, Clayton Brothers, just like 
all these like really like I never knew you can show illustration kind of work in galleries before because someone's like oh you should show this work in a gallery I was like really like I had no idea this but like this whole art movement started and I was just like there right when I was starting so my teacher got me into my first couple shows just like small group shows that he curated then he actually showed some other um of my classmates more than me like over the next couple of years but I was still growing like I wasn't someone that came out of school and I was like ready like uh I was like I just got to keep working at it and uh eventually like yeah he had this show in Brooklyn this uh, Riviera gallery and he's like yeah make three works and you know I'll have them in the show and I made like, these three 24 by 24 paintings that were a huge step forward for me and I was like really proud of them. And I brought them over. Show went well, but none of them sold. I was like, ah, super bummed. And then he took it upon himself to uh, take these three paintings over to Jonathan Levine. And I had gone to that gallery as an art student and later, and it was like my dream gallery. Like all my favorite artists were in this gallery. And so he's like, yeah, I took it over. And I was like, and he liked them. Nice. I was like, oh my God. And so like a week or two later, Jonathan Levine actually called me up. He's like, he's like, Hey, I got, you know, Jordan brought me over these paintings. I really like them. I'm going to, I'm going to hang them up in the back and, you know, just see how they do. See what the, re- you know, the reaction is. It's awesome. And then, like two of them sold right away. And then the other one sold like a couple weeks later. And he's like, he's like, all right, let's, uh, let's set up a group show for you. Like a two man show. Nice. And, uh, yeah, I mean that must have been fulfilling after having kind of looked up to the gallery as you know going there while you're in school and you know seeing all the people that you looked up to as an artist and then getting that kind of validation on the other side yeah. of it. That's pretty awesome. Oh yeah, it was unbelievable. Like I like hung up the phone. I was like, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk later. And hung up the phone. I was like doing like yes. yeah, flying <laughs> fist pumps, like jump kicks. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. Like it was a dream. Like to be able to show in there, and it's. It's funny, too, because, like, you know, I was making all this work, and I was like, yeah, you know, I'd like to show in galleries. That'd be cool. But I was never, like, making work explicitly by being like, oh, I need to be in galleries. I just need to. I was just, like, making work, and I was like, yeah, it'd be cool if I did it one day. I don't know somehow that attitude worked out because I wasn't too stressed out about getting work, work in galleries. And, like, when it showed up, like, I was like, I think it's all just people always, like, Students ask me, like, you know, how do you get everything rolling? And how do you, like, get your work out there? And, like, you just never know. Like, there's no way I can plan for Jordan to take my work over to Jonathan and for him to like it and for him to, like, hang it. And uh, all you can do is just take advantage of your opportunities. And uh, that's what I did. Like, I had a two-man show, and I just, like, busted my ass. And and, then that show went really well. And then it rolled into a solo show. And then other galleries approached me and like it just snowballed from there. So, And so was that first, um, you know, him hanging the three pieces that you had in the other show, selling those and then getting the, the two man show. Was that the point where you felt comfortable enough to start focusing on your own art practice full time? Or were you still trying to do commercial work? I think um, it was definitely the two man show. And I, I think when I approached my first solo show and I, I started uh, selling some prints and uh, having some group shows. And at that point, I think I was like busy enough where I was like, yeah, I can. Like at that point, I was still working a part-time job. And yeah, at that point, I'm like, all right. I think it was around 2007. I was like, all right, this is the time. I'm going to like just do this full time. And that's when you had your first, I guess, solo show with Think Space was 2007, I believe. Was... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, Andrew contacted me, I think, around the time I did my Levine shows. And he actually approached me first as a collector. Um, he like one of one of my small pieces and, uh, and then, yeah, then he's like, offer me a show there and, and, uh, they were awesome. Think space is great. Um, I love those guys so much. 
Yeah, you know, I've had Andrew's a regular at this point, but um, yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting to see. I mean, he does have a fantastic collection, so it's cool that he yeah, you know, his first, collection's insane. Yeah, yeah, it's, and I guess you've also shown you know another kind of strong relationship you've had was with Rock Larue in Seattle. I guess is having these types of strong gallery relationships. Do you feel that that's been an important component of your career? For sure. I mean, just things like. Uh, learning what your like price point is like just like the business side of stuff like i don't know like as an individual like what my value is in my work and then so learning that stuff really helped and like you know they have they're huge like collector people and and then especially back then like people like look to galleries to like find artists um it's changed a little bit now with, like social media and all that stuff but like they introduced me to the world and like shows back then were crazy, just so packed. And it's hard to believe I even like got involved with all these people like rock LaRue. Like I, I went to see rock LaRue in Seattle, um, like back in 2001. Cause I had some friends in Seattle and they're like, Oh, you got to check out this gallery, rock LaRue. I was like, wow, this place is amazing. And like, I remember approaching Kirsten uh, and I was like, yeah, maybe uh, I'd like to show my work here. And I showed her some stuff. She's like, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that was just like while I was in art school. So, and then, uh, yeah, then later I ended up working with her and yeah, it's just so crazy. Well, that's awesome. And, and I guess timeline wise, it looks like you moved to Portland around 2007. So a couple of years after that first, you know, show with ThinkSpace, I guess what, what motivated that move and why the, why did you want to go to the other coast? Just wanted to. <laughs> I'd never been to Portland. I didn't even like know what it looked like, really. I just like heard good things and I was like, I just wanted something different. Like I was a very kind of restless spirit for a long time. Like I'd be in a place for two years maybe and I'd be like, all right, I'm out of here. I need to experience some new things. So I just wanted to try it. And um, throughout my uh, art shows, I ended up meeting this other artist named uh, Evan B. Harris. And uh, he was based out of Portland, and we had a we had a show together in L.A. It wasn't I think space? Oh, God, what was it? It was run by Freddie Sarasoli, but I forget what it was called. But we had a show together. Oh no, she offered me a show, and she's like, "Who do you want to be with you?" And I was like, "Kathleen Lolly and Evan B. Harris," because I saw Evan's work on Juxtapose, hmm. and I was like, "Ah, oh, this guy's work is great." And uh, I showed up to L.A. I had nowhere to stay. I had no hotel or anything. This is how I rolled back then. I would just show up places and <laughs> I'm like, I'll figure it out when I get there. And I got there with all my bags and she's like, where are you staying? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> and Evan's like, he's like, oh, I'm staying with this collector at this collector's house. Uh, he has like a garage with a room above it. Just stay with me. And when I met this guy, he was like, like a brother. Like we just instantly connected. We were like pretty much best friends from like, day one and uh, he ended up being like one of my good friends in my life and he was out in portland so i was like yeah i'll go there and we ended up sharing a studio together and it was great nice how did you like living in portland while you're there i love i mean the city itself is beautiful like from spring to fall it's just an amazing place just but i honestly <laughs> i don't know like East Coast people are like a little different. Like there's this like innate wise assness to us <laughs> that di didn't really translate well in the West Coast. And like a lot of my good friends there ended up being from East Coast just because we, you know, so we can just like smart ass each other and like feel comfortable about it. Yeah, there's just like a oh, kind of a weird disconnect between attitudes and uh, and not, like not really meeting all that many people out there. And I just, I don't know, I missed the East Coast after a while. Um, How long did you stay before you moved back? Two years. Okay. Yeah, it was great. I mean, like, Portland's a great city. Uh, great art scene. Uh, I definitely really loved it there. But I just, like, you know, I miss my family. And, and, like, Pittsburgh's a place, like, they say, like, you leave and you always come back to. So I came back. Right on. And you've been there ever since? Yeah, like 2010. Okay. Sweet. So let's dive into your your actual work. And, and yeah. I know that, um, you know, one of the 
some of the adjectives that I see a lot that just you know describe your work is mystical, spiritual, um, you know, a very heavy kind of nature orientation. Mm-hmm. Um, almost like you're creating your own mythology in in a lot of ways. If you kind of look through the trajectory of your work over the course of your career, um, but a lot of your early work looked a lot different. Um, you know, if I'm looking at back at 2008, 2009, yeah. some of that work in that 2007 Think Space show, even um, very kind of perpetually autumn, um, very a lot of oranges, a lot of browns. A lot that of was, yeah. Right, right. So I guess, how did you get from from that to what your style ultimately turned into, which has a lot more prismatic colors, a lot more bright blues and purples, um, and then just the themes themselves, you're kind of zooming out a lot more. Uh, mm-hmm. Was it a very organic process getting from starting point to ending point, or was it more of a conscious decision where you sat down and it's like, oh, I want to go in a different direction? Um, I think it it evolved pretty naturally. Um, back then, a lot of the limitations was just from my own like skill set. Color wise, like you know, I just love autumn. Autumn like comes and it goes too quickly, so uh, part of it was just me wanting to like live in it a little longer. And then my work was like a lot more uh, line work and illustrative back then, because that's pretty much just what I knew. And I was just, I was still figuring out acrylic painting, figuring out techniques that like I felt were like mine. Like illustration in art school, like everyone was like just harping about style, like find your style. And so when I started painting, I was like this like kind of textured line work and like creature people, this is like my thing. Like I'm going to claim this kind of. So I'm going to run wild with this. And then like when it came to like, Painting like forest stuff, I don't know. I just like painting trees. Like, I like painting trees, grass, just like, and I'm an, I, I mostly grew up in a city and suburbs. So, you know, I'm not really like a, never really like lived in the woods or wasn't really a country person. So, but I don't know. I'll, actually, like when we were like kids, we did have a huge woods behind us. So we, we did like run around like wild animals back there. But, there's just like, I think it's all about mystery. Like there's a mystery to the woods and the forests, fairy tales, like all this stuff happens in the forests. Do you, do you think it was because that you lived in cities for so much that the nature was such this magical thing of like just the unknown environment that you weren't really used to? Yeah, I'd say it's so. Like, I mean, there are, I'm sure there are mysteries in the city that you can find. <laughs> like uh, probably some of them you don't want to find. But yeah, when it comes to like actual like folklore and like all those mysteries happen in the woods. Mm. So that's definitely initially like what drew me to it. When I started doing these paintings, it was very narrative driven. Like I had names, stories for everyone. Did you write those stories down? Like, I mean, outside of just developing a, a narrative for a particular piece, did you know the larger story outside of those works? Some of them. Yeah. Um, I definitely like, there was like a, this noble leader um, creature. He's like, it was the postcard for my first Levine solo show. It was like uh, all red leaves with this like creature with like uh, horns and there's a cat on his head. And I made a whole like story for him that he got his horns cut off and he got exiled. And then, so he had this like another one of my really popular paintings back then was like March of the Exiled. It was like this hornless creature, like leading like a kind of a parade of cats and like these like cats became like his crew, you know. So yeah, I definitely had more like solid stories. And then now it's more about capturing like an, an emotion what I'm going through. And along the way like of showing these paintings, like people come up to me and they like tell me like the story they have for it and what it reminds them of and then like this it made this really sh- kind of strong connection between me and my viewers because like we're mixing our life experiences together and coming up with these kind of like mutual stories and I was like there's such power in that that I want to like I want to go more towards that so now I feel like I'm more like giving people pieces to a story I mean they these paintings still like resonate hugely with like my life experience at the time but I think it's more powerful to have people like put their own life experiences and emotions and everything into it and have 
make their own story out of it. Hmm. And I guess the even the earlier narrative works uh, up to and including the more kind of emotion driven works that you're doing now, do those tie back to your own real world stories and experiences and, and emotions? Yeah, I mean, they certainly express like a time in my life what I'm going through. Even when I'm even when I was working on these month long paintings for shows, I would never really plan everything out. Like I would have some general idea of what this painting is going to look like. And this kind of allowed like life to kind of affect me on the way. So I would start out one place and by the end of it, it would be a, generally the same idea I had, but like completely different than what I intended it to be. Just because something would affect me personally. I would see something that would like inspire me and all this stuff would just piecemeal make it into my paintings along the like the four month journey of making a show. And I guess, how did your use of color evolve? Because, you know, like we were saying earlier, it was very kind of autumn focused, a lot of oranges and browns. Now it's very different. Um, So how did that evolution take place? And do you associate certain meanings with colors in this kind of emotional expression that you're trying for? Ah, colors, colors, something that uh, I mean, especially now it just like, um, just kind of becomes what it is. Like, it just makes sense to me, like what something should be. But I think um, learning to oil paint is what changed my palette a lot. Because back then it was just uh, acrylics. And I was like, eh, I'll just use these colors because I'm comfortable with them. And then um, I started mixing oils with acrylic. Like I would do the acrylic painting and then just do like some oil washes. But then like for a show in Rock La Rue, I started doing these like night sky paintings and like introducing blues. And I was like, all right, now I'm using blues and this is a whole new thing. And yeah, it just kind of evolved from there and just, you know, expanding my palette, just being more comfortable with new colors. A lot of it is just comfort with the the medium and just learning it. Okay. And you mentioned that, that, you know, going into a piece, you don't often have a a complete picture of what it is ultimately going to turn into, you kind of have a, a rough idea. How do you tend to arrive at your ideas for, for bodies of work or for an individual piece? Is it something that you're very kind of intentional at brainstorming or is it just you get you know ideas along the way and you write them down and then you come back to them later? Uh, with shows, like I'm, I'm always writing down ideas. Like my sketchbook, I wouldn't even call it a sketchbook. It's just an ideal book. It's like a bunch of scribbles with a bunch of writing, just being like, I'll come up with an idea and I'm like, all right, I just got to write it down or I'll forget because I definitely will forget if I don't write it down. So I just jot down on these ideas. I have this like whole book of ideas. And then when it, when I would come, come to a show, I'm like, all right, I'm going to start these two ideas first. And then I have all these other ideas. I'll come back to them. But once I start like the process of working on other paintings, like other ideas just come and so pretty much I would start out with two ideas that I knew and then the next ones just be all new ideas. Cause like, I don't know, you kind of get in a zone, like creatively while working on this stuff and the ideas just come out pretty naturally after a while. And I read that you have really like vivid dreams. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, like that's a thing, which I was, it's funny cause like timing wise, I was talking to a, a, another uh, artist friend of mine. We were talking about just she has very vivid dreams and sort of the blessing and the curse that comes with that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess, you know, do you remember your dreams after the fact? Is it something that you're able to kind of document? Yeah. I mean, sometimes I do like I go, I go on to awesome places when I dream. Um, I have like these fictionalized versions of cities I've lived in. Like I have a fictionalized version of Portland and New York. Um, and they're all interesting in their own way. And then some of them are just these places, like the the feelings of these like places I go, like stick with me. Like when I think of them now, like I remember this dream, I was like in a boat um, going down the stream, just in this like quiet woods. And I don't know, like it just gives me like this feeling that's like, it makes me like, want to cry. Um, and then like I went further and I was in this like weird city and I was like it's just like a place I wanted to be and so a lot of these places do come out in my work um this like I remember vividly in this one place 
this has happened a couple of times where I'm like, like if I was like in Antarctica or something, standing on the shore, looking at the ocean. And it's like this feeling like I'm on the very edge of the world, like away from everything. And, and it's like scary and like beautiful and calming all at the same time. And just like, and I remember like the smells and everything. It's, and I also have like dreams where like, I remember other memories from other dreams like, I don't remember them here, but I'll remember them in my dreams. It's so weird. Wow. That's like, crazy. <laughs> I mean, do you have, like, techniques for... I mean, do you try to, to remember them? Is it something that you, you try to capture? Or do you just... You happen to remember whatever you remember? Like, do you try to... to are there techniques that people can employ to make it easier to remember the dreams? <laughs> no, I, I do nothing special. <laughs> like, they just come and you know, I remember what I can... I mean, I guess I sh- I sh- probably should have like a dream journal or something, but <laughs> my wife says I also talk a lot in my dreams. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. One time I like, I sat straight up and I was like, don't worry, there's arms for everyone. <laughs> I guess I was having some like zombie, like apocalypse, apocalypse dream. <laughs> and like, yeah, I'll just like, she'll be in the other room and she'll just hear me going, ah! <laughs> just like laughing and. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, I go to some That's weird amazing. places. So I guess, you know, I was going to ask you, like, once you have a solid idea for a piece, how you kind of develop that composition. But from what you're saying, if, if you're developing it along the way, do you even have a, do you even try to nail down the composition at an early stage in your in your process? Um, With my current digital work, definitely more than I did with my uh, paintings. Uh, there's... The technique for, for my oil paintings, like, you know, it worked out for me. Um, I just kind of like um, did it what felt right along the way. Didn't plan much. Experimented a lot with the uh, painting techniques. And then when I got the digital stuff and I was like, all right, I'm going to like draw out more. Over these 12 years of doing this with my paintings, my fundamentals and my drawing skills have gone to complete shit. It's like... Oh God, I don't know how to like draw anymore. It was like kind of, kind of crushing a little bit. (laughs) So I'm actually like taking drawing classes again, like almost like intermediate beginner style. Cause you know, I want to be able to like draw the stuff out more and uh, get back to more fundamentals that I've lost along the way. Well, I think it, I think, I guess it speaks to the fact that, that a lot, all of this is, is not innate talent as much as practice and it's a oh, muscle yeah. that you have to, to work out. Yeah. You know? That muscle got real weak. Mm. Um, so, oh, for sure. Like people always ask me how to get good and it just time repetition, just pump out work. Like luckily, like, um, I was able to make a living while getting better at my craft. So a lot of people aren't fortunate enough to have that situation, but I was lucky like a gallery galleries took a chance on me early and I was able to like evolve my work and just like, improve myself along the way. So. Yeah. Well, and I wanted to ask you about that evolution. I mean, we talked a lot about evolution and themes and colors, but your process uh, you introduced at some point, this super unique resin like pouring process where yeah. you have, <laughs> you'll have layers and layers on top of things, which, I, you know, from what we were talking about earlier, kind of drove the way that you even worked on them so that you didn't fully conceptualize the entire piece. You would maybe conceptualize one layer at a time mm-hmm. and that would allow for, you know, iteration and, and innovation along the way. So how did you first start incorporating that resin process in and, and where did you even get the idea for kind of adding that to your, your process? I think I saw like a like a Facebook post of someone working in resin and like having this like three D effect. I was like, that looks awesome. Like, um, was this guy painting like goldfish? I don't know. Have you seen this guy? Uh, I think he's a Japanese artist. Uh, no, I mean maybe. I, I... So he like makes these like goldfish that look super realistic, and I'm like, that's never gonna be me. Like, I'm never gonna make anything <laughs> that realistic. But I'm gonna like do my own thing with this because like I love this idea of like making this like little world you can like kind of like live in and i've always wanted to do that with my paintings anyways but that like had this like almost shadow boxy like world that you can like physically like feel like you're in that just like sounded really cool to me and like something i wanted to do and then i had to i had a show at think space coming up so i was like yeah 
maybe I'll do a couple. And then I started doing a couple and I was like, I'll just do them all. <laughs> just do them all this way. And my wife's like, what are you doing? You don't know how to do this stuff here. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'll figure it out. <laughs> so yeah, I started doing them. And the one thing I didn't realize, I was like, yeah, I want these like, you know, very thick resin paintings. So like the depth will be amazing. I didn't realize how heavy they would be. Oh yeah. They were like the first resin paintings I did, like they're dangerous. They're like 60 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> they're so heavy. I did ship them all to, think space and I was like oh my god <laughs> they were like beasts but the one thing I, I kind of like to resin like a lot of my techniques came by accident like I was doing this like a uh, background with oil paints and then I was like what happens if I put the oil paint still wet and I put it in there and then I poured it in started getting these swirls and then I was like I accidentally put like wet oil paint into the resin as it was wet. And I was like, oh no, like I used a blowtorch to, you know, get the bubbles out. I was like, the whole thing's going to catch on fire. But I guess the oil just went right under. So it didn't catch on fire. And then like, I really liked how it looked. So I started putting more oil paint in there and like making these like really cool patterns. And I was like, yeah, this is like, this is like so many of my techniques like happen by accident. Yeah. That's awesome. I think that's, a, I think that's a lot of artists. Like what I, you know, that comment makes me think back of the conversation that I had with, with Crayola, Greg Simpkins. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, one of his kind of light um, layering techniques, he just, it was pure accident. And it was, he was trying to fix a problem and it turned into something that he still uses today. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like when I first started out, I was doing, um, you know, like these grass patterns and I was using, um, there's like this uh, shoe polish that a lot of like taggers use because it was like impossible to get off anything. So I was using it for my line work and I was like using matte medium to put down paper because I would draw the paper and put matte medium down. And I was like rubbing it with this like old brush and I was just catching the top of the, the matte medium texture. I was like, Oh, I'll play around with this. And I started making grass and t tree textures and pretty much that technique carried me like through, I, st I still do it. And I was totally by accident. <laughs> I, I mean, you, you definitely seem to be somebody that explore, likes to explore just techniques, process, stuff like that. I mean, are there, are there mediums that you haven't had a chance to explore that you would like to someday? Um, animation. Like, that kind of stuff is... I mean, you, you were starting your career wanting <laughs> to do animation, so now it's like full circle. You're yeah. coming back around to it? Yeah. Like, uh, I'm actually writing some stuff. Like, it's... Part of the reason I also want to do digital is so I can like work on stuff for projects like this. Like I definitely have some personal that I would love to animate someday. So, but now I did I did sculpture for some of my resin paintings, so I get to do that. I like I definitely feel like I'm pretty creatively restless. Like I like to do new things. Yeah, but another reason I liked resin is because like I would finish a layer. And like I would endlessly work on things, just overwork things. So, but once the the resin layer is on there, it's like that's it. You got to move forward. But it became like too complicated for me after a while. Like working on fifteen or paintings, all different layers needed to be, you know, planned. Plus the paintings themselves, the drying times, like all this stuff. Like, yeah, it almost killed me. Did it did, because of the layering the, the, that process, um, you know, and the drying times that are involved in every layer? Did it kind of force you to work on multiple pieces at once just to make that work? I always, I always kind of did, especially when I started working with oils, because like you know they all had their drying times, so I was never, I never had any downtime. I was always working on something, because yeah, with shows you had to like utilize every minute. It's insane. Like every show I've done came down to the last hour. <laughs> I mean, that's a, a stressful thing, um, but I mean, sometimes that makes people thrive. I mean, the pressure of that people do well in that sometimes. Yeah, I would crumble under that type of pressure. It was uh, it was rough, honestly, especially with the with the resin paintings. Like, I would have to plan everything out, so I was working on the last layer for each painting mm. at once, and so I would like finish the early painting, you know, for the postcard promo stuff for the gallery. But I'm sitting there like two or three weeks before the show's supposed to open and none of them are done. 
but they're all like one layer from being done. So, but the last two weeks, like everything's just like done, 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 done. <laughs> but yeah, it's. So it's, it's, it's like either everything is going to be done in time or nothing is going to be done. <laughs> yeah. <time. laughs> wow. But I definitely, um, the art show was, circuit was a grind. Like, uh, it really took it out on me. Like the last two or three months of an art show, you're working 60, 70 hours a week. Um, I lost like 15 pounds. I got shingles. Like it was really bad for my health. And, uh, just was not around for my wife. And it was, I was like, I need to, I need to step back for a bit. Yeah. Well, and, and I guess that's a good segue into uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, which was your Patreon. Uh, you know, I've, having followed several artists, you know, it doesn't seem like that's something that a ton of artists have, have taken advantage of, but I do see a handful of people that have, you know, made a good run at, at Patreon and, and made good use of it. I think one thing that I've, for the people that haven't really jumped on to that platform, I think they sometimes struggle with how do I use it? You know, what, what do I offer? What are my, my tiers, stuff like that for uh, my show has a Patreon too. I think it's more obvious for yeah podcasters yeah. what we're doing because we can, we're releasing episodes at regular basis. We can do, you know, extra episodes or early episodes. Like there's a little bit easier of a decision of what we even offer to the patrons for artists. I think it's a little bit more ambiguous and you got to kind of figure that out. So what was your approach and how did you first get started with that? Um, well, it first started with me wanting to learn digital painting. Um, and I wanted to learn digital painting because uh, I had a like a really rough year with uh, art shows. Um, I had one gallery. I mean, I guess people would figure it out anyways, but I was working with uh, Jonathan Levine. And he just went through a, a really rough time. Like, uh, he was doing really well. Then all this stuff happened and he wasn't able to pay artists on time. And, uh, I knew it was killing him not to be able to pay these guys. And, you know, people were like pissed at him. I I mean, obviously like we depend on this stuff to live. And, uh, so, you know, I, I felt really bad for him, honestly. And it was really like fucking me over pretty bad too. Because you put so much of your resources into these shows and you need to get paid because you kind of like build up a little debt. You get paid a bunch of money and then use that money for the next show leading up to the next show. So he was like able to just pay me in chunks. But I was like, all right, it's putting me behind. But, you know, I have my Think Space show coming up. So just make it up then. And then my Think Space show is coming up. And I was like, I'm just every idea for some reason felt big. So I just like made all these big paintings and those for my sh- prismatic show, which I still think to this day is like my best show. And I was like, so proud of this work and like none of it sold mm-hmm. on opening day or the opening. And it's never happened to me before. And it really kind of propelled me into like an existential crisis and a financial one. Like I was in bad shape. It led to probably like almost a year long depression. Like it was hard. The worst part is you don't know you're in it. Yeah. Um, I also like was taking Chantix to quit quit smoking. And I guess that leads to psychosis and depression as well. So it's like this like triple whammy of awfulness. So I was just horrified to make artwork. So was that affecting your just your ability to even form ideas in, in order to move forward? Yeah, yeah. Like I would like go up to a like a blank wood panel and start working, or I would think about starting it, and it would be like I was standing on like a cliff edge. Mm. And to like start would like to be like it's like jumping off a cliff. It was it was really hard. Um it was just like this fog. I couldn't get out of it. And so it took me like eight months to make a a 16 by 20 painting after that. And I made it for a group show and it was actually called Out of the Fog. And like most of my work dealt with getting out of depression. (laughs) I don't think people know this. Like they look at it, you probably can't tell, but it's just me like getting out of depression. And I also think it was, could be burnout 
too. Like, I think I was just burnt out. And I was just reading something today. It's like, it takes you like, like two years to get out of burnout. And that's right around the time that like things started clicking with me again. So it definitely been that as well. But crawling out of that, I was like, I just need more agency over my professional life. So I'm going to start focusing more on prints and doing digital stuff and then also do some art shows just so I'm not like depending on art shows to live because there's just too much uncertainty. Like all I know is the only thing I know when I make an art show is that I'm having an art show. That's it. <laughs> like what happens after that is like totally out of my hands. So I just wanted more control over that stuff. Well, I mean, it's, and it's smart just to establish these sorts of passive income in parallel mm-hmm. to your art practice so that even if, you know, you, you have highs and lows at those low points, you still have some passive income to fall back on. Yeah. And I was like reaching this point with art shows, especially uh, after like all this stuff I went to, I was like, I feel like every painting I, I make needs to like sell. Mm-hmm. And it's just such a bad way to approach making artwork. Yeah. So I I just took a step back and I'm like, what can I do to like, just make income that's more consistent and then not have to like worry about all this stuff so much. And so then Patreon actually like, they contacted me like years before while I was still doing art shows. And I was like, "Eh, I don't know. I don't think it's for me. And then I went to, I thought about it more and I was like, yeah, this maybe is something I want to do. So I like, I set up like a whole welcome kit with like a certificate and a pin and like everything looked great, but I had to, I had to currently like stop doing that because people were like joining, getting the kit and then quitting. (laughs) So I was like, each kit cost me like $15, you know, and I was charging people like $5 and I was like, I don't know if losing $10 a patron is like what this was meant for. So, well, I mean, so it's interesting you mentioned that because I, I know that the advice that Patreon as a platform sends out to new creators now is to wait three months until you send out like like yeah. welcome type stuff for the mm-hmm. exact same reason that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish I had figured that out before. But it was good. Like I started Patreon and I honestly still, it's still really hard to figure out what to put on there. Um Cause I want to put on like process stuff, but I'm still learning digital stuff. So I don't feel like, you know, people should learn from me yet. And like, there's other Patreon people like, um, this artist, Loish. She, um, does these amazing gestural, like, um, drawings and paintings and like, and she does it all like real time. She'll like make this amazing painting digitally in like hours, but they're like, they're like these creative extroverts, you know, like you, they like thrive with attention and, you know, they could do like all these amazing things, but I like, I just feel like I'm very much a introvert when it comes to creative stuff. So it's going to take up some, I need to be confident in my stuff before I start like sharing it more. Like I'll show process stuff just so people know how I do it, but I kind of like want a disclaimer there. Like don't learn from me. Like there's better people to learn from. And, like, I didn't mean to, like, transition so much of my stuff over to digital, but I'm just enjoying it so much. Like, it's, like I said, like, after those, like, shows, it was really hard for me to, like, enjoy working again. And working with this stuff is just, like, the joy and the the excitement is back. So I'm just kind of sticking with it. And I just, the results are great, too. Like, I think I'm making some of my favorite work of all time right now. What's the reception been like just uh, on the platform and in your collector community in general? I'm not sure about the collector. Like, I haven't been in many art shows like, recently. Um, not intentionally. I'll, some some galleries, uh, I guess when I was going through my depressive stage, like, I wasn't really writing people back. And so uh, I haven't been, you know emailed or anything about upcoming shows from some galleries anymore. So that's kind of sad, but you know, I don't blame them. Like I was going through some stuff. 
mean, do you think it's something you'd want to get back into? I mean, I know you said you've, you're you're liking and enjoying the digital um, you know work right now. Do you think you'd want to get back into the the gallery circuit? I'm not sure, honestly. I do miss it. Um, I miss openings and uh, being part of the community, and I, I'd say yeah, I still want to do some like you know, not like a full solo show or anything again. And then I'm also trying to think of ways where I can like bring my digital stuff to a gallery. I'm working on a way right now because uh, with digital work, you don't have that like precious object that you do when you make an oil painting. It's like this like one precious object and then you make your prints and stuff from that. So digital doesn't really have that, but um, I started making these really nice metal prints that are like mounted and they feel and they look amazing. So I'm uh, going to play around with that, see how that goes. Very cool. So I, I, let's, I guess let's talk about what you have coming up. Do you have any, like, what's your focus been on this year? Has it been entirely on digital? Do you have anything that you haven't talked about yet that you'd want to share? Um, I'd say, yeah, I'm just working on digital stuff right now. Um, Uchari Gallery, do you know them in Australia? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so most recently I've been showing with them. Like, I just send them, like, you know, six paintings for, like, a small little thing every once in a while. Um, but we were supposed to do a show during the pandemic. Mm. Um, I did one actually during the beginning and, um, we said for the next one, we wanted to wait till I can actually go. Cause, uh, I went to my first show there and it was awesome. Like I love Australia and, uh, Melbourne. They're, they're awesome. I love them so much. Um, they order like tons of prints from me cause like they sell a lot of prints and like I send work to them and yeah, they're just a solid crew. They're good people. Very cool. So you have anything coming up with them? So I think, uh, we're talking next year. Nice. So we might do it next year. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to go there because, you know, I want to go back. I love it there. And and like we were talking about earlier, it's not the most, (laughs) not the most travel friendly time, um, to be, uh, out in the world. No, no. Yeah, um, it's going to take a while for me to like be able to feel comfortable in a plane or inside a restaurant. And, yeah, especially that flight. You're in there for like, yeah. you know, 16 hours or 13 hours. I forget. But yeah, for my last trip, I was like, I'm going to buy a Nintendo Switch and just play video games for <laughs> 10 hours. Worked out really well. Nice. So I guess uh, where can people find you online so they can stay up to date with all this stuff you got going on? Um, I'd say... Instagram is probably the thing I update the most. And then Instagram just shares with my Facebook. Um, so those two are both good places. Uh, Patreon, for sure. Like, There's some behind the, th- the scenes stuff that I only post to Patreon. So that would be a good place. And then I also have a newsletter you can find through my website. Awesome. Very cool. So last question, and this is something that I like to ask everybody. Uh, who is one artist that you'd like to see me have on the show? Um, Aaron Weisenfeld. Okay, nice. I'd love to hear what he says. He's uh he's one of my favorites. I just love his work. We there's like a there's a feeling in his work that like I feel in my work. It's like this weird like kind of scary beautiful solitude. Um, there's also also this guy, uh, Killian Eng. Do you know his work? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm familiar. I, I think I was introduced to him first on like his movie poster side, like the stuff that he's done yeah. with Mondo, stuff like that, and then yeah. got more into his his personal you know work as well. Yeah, and he's like uh, he's someone I look up to, like digital stuff. Like our styles are completely like different. Like he does his line art, his line work is just outstanding. But uh, his. Uh, he just seems very creative and I'd love to see like what his process is for sure. Awesome. Very cool. Well, Andy, thank you so much for doing the show, man. This has really been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. It was a, uh, it was really fun too. So that's it for this episode of art affairs. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Andy. It was really interesting to see how his art and his processes have evolved over the course of his career. From his early, more narrative, autumnal work with characters and and a focus on, on telling stories, 
to his resin-layered, prismatic-colored, and emotion-driven works, and now his exploration into digital art and trying to establish a you know stable source of income to go along with his less deterministic gallery work. And I was really sorry to hear about him you know, going through burnout and, and a, the bout of depression that, that accompanied that. I definitely know how hard that can be. And you know, I'm, I'm glad that he was able to you know, ultimately find a way out and, and regain his creative spark. It does take some time, though, and, and somebody who's, who's actively experiencing that, you, know, you just have to be kind to yourself and, and give yourself space to, to heal. And while it doesn't sound like he's quite ready to do a large body of works yet, like a solo show, it does sound like he has some new stuff coming up at Utra Gallery in Australia. And, of course, the digital work that he's been putting out through his Patreon. Oh, and possibly even animated works as well, which sounds really cool. Definitely be sure to follow his Instagram to keep up with all the new stuff he has going on. So thanks again to Andy for joining me today, and thank you for checking out the show. I'm truly grateful for your support. And just a reminder, one big way you could help out if you're really enjoying the show would be to check out the show's Patreon. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash artifairs. And as always, you can contact me through my website at artifairspodcast.com or on Instagram at artifairspodcast. So until next time... Be good to yourself, and be good to each other. Mm -hmm.